Hi out there. Welcome to the Polar Bears International Tundra Connections program today. I'm Don Moore and with me are Megan Owen and Andy DeRoche. And we'll be talking about uh, polar bear behavior in our changing world today. It's polar bear season here in Churchill and we're coming to you live from Tundra Buggy 1 on the shores of the Hudson's Bay with Arctic winds and polar bears right outside of our window. Uh, we'll talk about bear behaviors today and how human bear relations might change in our changing world. Our target audience includes classrooms and people from all across the country. Our partners on today's program are Explore.org and members of the Association of Zoos and Aquariums that are Arctic Ambassador Zoos and Aquariums. This program will last about 50 minutes, including time for questions and answers. We'll also talk about how you can help polar bears and other bears at our planet, and we'd love to hear about what all of you are doing to increase your conservation activities. You can send us uh, conservation activities and questions through our chat window. You can email us at questions at pbears.org, and we'll share your questions or your conservation actions during the webcast for you school kids out there. Um, we, we like examples like, does your school use power strips to save energy? Uh, do you compost your cafeteria ways? Do you have bike to school days? And things like that. And we'll try to share those during the program. You can send us a tweet at uh, hashtag Tundra Connections and ask your questions that way. Um, so again, I'm Don Moore. I'm from Smithsonian Institution and the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. And uh, I'm a, a mammalogist with a passion for polar bears and for doing outreach like this to people like you. And I'd like my other two panelists to um, say who they are and where they're from. My name is Megan Owen and I'm a behavioral ecologist from the Institute for Conservation Research at the San Diego Zoo. I get to manage our bear research programs and one of the things we focus on is uh, supporting conservation in the wild by, by having zoo bears participate in conservation-based research and that has been a really, really satisfying undertaking. We focus on, on all species of bear, but polar bears are also a particular passion of mine. I'm Andy DeRoche. I'm a professor at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Canada. I've been studying polar bears for about 30 years across the Arctic, mainly in Canada, but also the Norwegian Arctic. Um, that's the main species that I study, but we also study grizzly bears in my research group and other Arctic large mammals. So again, we're out here uh, near the town of Churchill in Manitoba, uh, on the shore of the western shore of the Hudson's Bay. Churchill has about 900 people in this little town, and uh, there are polar bears in Churchill this time of year. And that, that season lasts from about June to November. The polar bears are here on land waiting for uh, the sea ice to form back on the bay. And uh, they're here for a while. We got out here on buggy one. We rolled out here on uh, tundra buggies, which are these kind of big school bus platforms on tall tires. And uh, that keeps us out of harm's way with the polar bears, which are on the ground. And um, certainly we always drive out here. So Andy and Megan, I'd like to ask you, um, what are your favorite Well, for me, I, I think you have to remember that this is the most carnivorous of the bear species we've got. So for me, it's, it's really all about hunting behavior and, and watching the bears actually killing seals. Uh, it's kind of a, a bloodlust sort of thing, but that's really what makes a polar bear tick. And, you know, they, they have these really carnivorous claws for a reason. And, and part of the reason is that the seals that they're trying to catch, usually ring seals, which are about up to 150 pounds or 70 kilograms, um, they're really slippery and of course they don't want to be caught so uh, a lot of times I've been watching them uh, sneaking in and trying to um, to kill seals and it's it's a game of sort of a cat and mouse the seals are are what we call vigilant that's the word we use I mean they're looking around and they they're not just sleeping they if they are on the top of the ice they're looking around all the time but of course it's it's basically it's a bit of a game trying to um, get close enough so you can make the last big dash in to uh, catch the seal. So it's a bit like this deal where they, they keep working their way closer. They're using, sea ice is rough. So you, you it, don't think about it like lake ice. It's rough and it's, and they use that terrain to get in so that last little bit they can make that dash. And a couple of times I've seen the bears coming in to make a kill 
and it looks sort of like, you know, as we just finished up with the World Series, and you look at those guys going to catch that ball, it looks like that when a pole bear is coming in to make a kill. And, and basically, they've got to cover up that hole um, before the seal disappears down it. So it, it's kind of a, a neat process. And, of course, once they kill that seal, it, it's another neat behavior because what they really want to do is eat as much of that seal as quickly as absolutely possible. And the deal there is you want to eat it quickly because if you're, unless you're the biggest bear out there, um, there's a good chance that somebody's going to take it away from you. So it's, it's an interesting dynamic out there. And so you eat as much as you can, as quickly as you can, uh, and then basically be willing to run away if somebody else wants your dinner. Well, I think for myself, actually, on the opposite end of the spectrum is watching mothers with cubs. And this goes for all the bear species. All polar bear cubs, or all bear cubs, actually, are born highly altricial. They're completely dependent on their mothers for everything that they need, their food, their warmth, and anything else. So watching bears uh, from birth to, to the time that they leave the den has been fascinating. Watching how mother's behavior changes uh, with those cubs as they go is also fascinating because there's a point at which the cubs become a little more robust and mothers play quite rough with their, with their cubs and that's part of cub development. They really need to, to get strong, learn how to maneuver in whatever habitat they're in and the mother's job is to make sure that they're ready, ready to, to live a life on their own when it's time. And this again, w across the bear species, we see uh, all sorts of very similar tactics from their mothers and uh, it, never, it never gets boring. It's interesting when you, I, I've watched a lot of different mothers over the years, um, and there's a lot of individual behavior. Some mothers are incredibly in, attentive to their young, uh, and they pay a lot of attention to where their cubs are, and other mothers are just like, well, mm -hmm. you know, go off and we'll, we'll catch up with you later. Um, it's also interesting around the tundra buggy, sometimes when we have mothers with cubs coming in, um, the cubs are the ones that are causing a lot of trouble because they want to come right in and see what this big thing is and and it, it's kind of a, a neat deal and uh, as we had one reporter out here say it's kind of like we're big pink monkeys inside the zoo and they come to take a look at us uh, it's kind of a neat sort of dynamic and but almost always it's the cubs that want to come in and see what's going on their curiosity is intense so when you get a little bit older uh, you get a little bit more uh, wary about what humans might be. And one of the, another point on what Andy just mentioned that we've seen in, in, in a number of bear species is that the maternal behavior changes with experience. So when the, uh, the mother has a cub for the first time, there's a lot more caution around the handling of the cubs and a lot more attentiveness with the cubs. And, and again, this emphasizes the benefits of studying bears and zoos as we get this very detailed understanding of behavior as it changes over time with a particular individual. And we've had mothers with more experience seem like, you know, that they know this cub will survive. So that the attentiveness in their behavior really, really changes over time. It's fascinating. And that's interesting. That happens with a lot of mammals, right? Not just bears, but bears are highly intelligent. So here's what we'd like to do uh, with you folks who are watching today. We'd like to share some videos with you. Um, right now, uh, we're looking at a, a sleeping bear live. And um, so, Andy, do you want to just say what these bears are doing and why they sleep so much? That was a question that we had earlier in the week. Yeah, well, there's not much else going on here right now. These bears are in a holding pattern. Uh, they're on land here, but they're waiting for the sea ice to reform. Um, this is not really their preferred habitat at all. If given the option, a polar bear would be on the sea ice 365 days a year. And that's really where they want to be right now. They're waiting for the ice to form. And when I first came here about 30 years ago, the bears would be getting pretty close to departing uh, just about this time in the next few days, actually. And so, but what's happened with climate change is they're on land longer now. They, they come on shore earlier in the springtime and they're staying later into the fall. And that's a real concern. But while they're on shore, this bear is just basically saving kicking energy. back and there's saving energy. Not much to eat there's here. There's not uh, much there's to eat here. Uh, there's and, a few and blueberries some and, and sometimes some goose eggs earlier um, in the every year. So often they might um, find every so often they might find a dead shore, seal washed up on shore, but it's not worth investing a lot of energy in trying to feed. So the bears are just laying back and saving energy. They have a special physiology at this time of year 
we call it a walking hibernation. And that's an important component. It helps them conserve energy and, and conserve some of the components, uh, protein components, and they can recycle them back into protein. So it's a neat, they have some really neat tricks that they have up their sleeves in, in terms of trying to deal with this long period away from food. It's important to think also that if we went further south right now, we've actually got mothers in dens that they'll be pregnant right now. They'll give birth to their cubs uh, about another month from now. And, but they'll go eight months without eating anything. So they have to come ashore incredibly fat and basically have all the nutrients that they need to rear those cubs up until they head back out into the sea ice at the end of February to into early March. And for those of you out there who already um, have studied animal behavior, you know that ethology is uh, one of the fields of, of animal behavior. And an ethogram is a full catalog of animal behaviors, and resting is actually a behavior we often use mm -hmm. on an ethogram. Um, so uh, I'd like to say again that after we go through these videos today, we'll be taking uh, live questions, and you can send those to our um, email, questions at pbears.org. You can put them into the chat window, uh, or you can send them to our, our Twitter account again. Um, so. Uh, BJ, I think we're ready to roll through some some videos, and I'd like the scientists here to just uh, talk about these videos that you're seeing. Well, this What's is this behavior. This is uh, basically this is a group of big adult males, and it, it's interesting because if you had um, uh, a group of males like this out together out on the sea ice, there's no way they would ever come this close to each other. At this time of year, there's a whole relaxation going on. There's, there's no mates to fight over, so there's no sex going on. Um, there's no food to fight over, and there's no space to fight over. So they actually change their whole social structure. They actually become um, incredibly tolerant of each other. And it's interesting, we come in sometimes with, to catch uh, males in a group like this, and they'll actually go shoulder to shoulder and stare down the helicopter. Uh, it's pretty impressive when you got several tons of bears. Uh, you can have sometimes 14, 15, 16 bears all together in this tiny little area and they're incredibly tolerant of each other um, and seemingly seek each other out. And we're not sure the function of it. Um, it's probably something to do with some understanding of where you fit in the hierarchy in the population. Mm -hmm. And so uh, maybe it's important in the context that you know that relative to that other bear, I think I've seen him before or I've smelt him before. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I know that that bear is really big and really strong and I don't want to fight with him over that seal or fight with him for access to mate with a female. So um, it's an interesting behavior. We don't see it in a lot of other places, but it is spotted throughout their range. It's just much more common here in Western Hudson Bay. Mm. And we do see other bears uh, grouping up around food sources as well. It, it comes all comes down to resources with bears, I think, and it really demonstrates that flexible sociality. So the solitary uh, lifestyle of most bear species has to do with not competing for resources, generally speaking, and then at times like this, when there's no resources to compete over, they tolerate each other. It's an interesting one because it's, it's again, one of the really neat scenarios is that uh, indigenous people in the town of Kaktovik in Alaska, they hunt bowhead whales and then they bring the carcasses ashore. Uh, and the leftovers, are, of course, are, are a bonanza for, for polar bears in that area. And so you get into that situation and now we have a food resource, but it's a massive food resource. Right. There's no point in trying to protect it. So of course, then you can end up with 20, 30, 40 bears all sitting there having this big whale uh, meal, but you can't protect it. There's no meaning to try to push them off. So again, you see this flexible uh, adaptation of individuals to the situation mm -hmm. that they're in. And probably our viewers in temperate regions are familiar with bears at, at dump sites or at berry patches or something like that. And that would be the equivalent of super abundant food resource. Mm -hmm. Exactly, right. yeah. yeah. <clears throat> Fascinating. Uh, do we have another video? We've got cubs nursing. Can we talk about that? Sure, this is great footage. I mean, obviously the cubs need to nurse and the mother's milk is incredibly rich and uh, we can't hear it, but the cubs might also be emitting what we call a humming vocalization. And we, we don't know the precise communicative function of that vocalization, but it's very common in seven of the eight bear, spe bear species when cubs are nursing to, to emit this very, very loud, repetitive vocalization. 
and uh, the mother is just going to sit there as long as the as long as she's uh, patient and the cubs are hungry. It's neat. The polar bears actually will nurse their cubs for two and a half years, and it's it's interesting because there's a change in the milk composition over time. Uh, it actually uh, gets less less fat when they're really small. The cubs have about forty percent milk fat, and then it declines down to being pretty pretty um, weak and not a big energy transfer between mother and young. Um, but it's probably important in maintaining that family group together and sort of maintaining the co cohesiveness of the family bond. Um, but it's also when we're catching bears, we've also done a fair bit of work on on milk composition. Mm -hmm. So we actually take milk samples. Um, and it's interesting, we've worked with zoos to try to improve the formulas that have been used in zoos. And one of the questions I always get, and it's kind of like a good joke, I think, um, but how do you milk a polar bear? And of course my answer is carefully. No, we milk them, we milk them when, they're, when they're mobilized. We give them a little bit of a drug called oxytocin. It's a milk letdown drug, and then we can take little tiny samples. Um, polar bears don't give up milk very easily. But the interesting thing is, that, of course, then people always go, well, have you tasted it? Well, we're not like chugging back glasses of this stuff, but I have tasted it. And it has this very fishy marine taste. Um, and of course, that reflects the idea that all of the energy that polar bears rely on uh, for their existence really does come from that marine environment. Of course, they're eating seals, but the seals are eating fish. And a lot of the uh, chemical compounds in the fats go right from the fish into the seals, into the polar bears, and they're not highly modified. So you, you get that really fishy, milky taste. It's, it's not really something that would market well. So I'm curious too, <laughs> because you had just mentioned that their uh, milk is 40% fat. They might fast for up to eight months. That's, that's quite an energy balance there. So how much weight would a female lose as during the course of denning? Over that eight months, they can drop easily by half of their body mass uh, in that eight month period. So it varies depending on how many cubs they have and how fat they were. Uh, and and it's, it's, it's pretty incredible. You see these huge rotund uh, females going into the denning areas and some of them are so fat they can barely move and they move very slowly. Um, and then when they're coming out, they're just basically on the edge. And, and it's interesting because the whole life history of polar bears is, is based on this idea that they can absolutely count on finding seals in the springtime. Because that's when ring seals, uh, that's the, the sort of the smaller of their meal packages. This is a bearded seal we've got up. That's the larger one. Um, they can be up to 800 uh, pounds, 400 kilos. Um, and basically they're giving birth to their pups in the springtime. And so the mothers come out of their dens just perfectly timed to be able to access seals. So it's again, it's something we see with a lot of different uh, mammals is they time their reproduction to periods of abundance. So when they really need energy, mm -hmm. uh, it's out there for them. And Andy, so polar bears are pretty massive bears and you said that they lose 50% of their weight. Can you give our viewers some sense of what those weights are in the fall and the spring in pounds and kilograms? Yeah, we, we actually had a, a female that we caught here back in the 1980s, uh, and she weighed about just about 200 pounds when we caught her, uh, so she was around 100 kilograms. And then when we caught her a year later, she was pregnant, and she was up to almost 800 pounds, so her weight wow. had gone up a factor of four. Um, and so she weighed about 400 kilos and that female was kind of unusual as well because she went on to produce triplets um, and she was still in pretty good shape when she came out of the den in the springtime but that's one of the benefits of being incredibly fat is she actually had a built-in buffer uh, to make sure that her cubs did really well and she did really well pulling off those triplets. We don't see triplets here anymore. It's incredibly rare now and that's a function of the changing sea ice conditions here. Well, thanks. All right, BJ, can we see another uh, video? What have we got here? <laughs> we have a cub playing with a, with a willow branch that's just found. And, and like we were talking about earlier, play behavior is incredibly important for young animals of all species. It provides a great opportunity to test their limits, to, to interact with their environment or other animals of their species and, and really start to get a sense of what they can do. Play behavior is something that you're not going to see a lot of in adult animals, especially bears, because uh, they're energetically constrained and so they don't waste a lot of energy in play behavior. But for a young animal, it's essential for, for understanding how to, to navigate their environment. 
once they're out on their own, they're going to have to find their own food. They're going to have to figure out which other polar bears to, to seek out, which polar bears to avoid. And all of this play behavior supports uh, navigating that process. It, it's really important. It's, it's, of course, it's also about coordination and building muscle strength and endurance. Uh, and it's basically, it's a, it's a form of polar bear exercise. This little jump this cub just mm -hmm. did is exactly the behavior it will use when it's off on its own hunting seals for breaking through uh, snow. And what they, because a lot of the time, um, their prey, which are ring seal pups, they're actually born in a little snow cave. And the way polar bears catch them is by rearing up on their hind legs and then smashing through with their front paws to get access to uh, the seal pup that's inside. So these are all behaviors that are fairly normal. Uh, this sort of rolling around on the snow is something we see a lot when a polar bear um, is larger and it swims in open water. They, they have to dry themselves off, otherwise you turn into a big ice block. So quite often you see, a, like just like a dog, they shake, but then what they do is they find a patch of dry snow and they roll around in the dry snow and basically use it like a bath towel to get some of the excess water off their fur so they don't cart around a bunch of ice. And observing these types of natural behaviors really helps us with uh, animals in zoos as well. We, we all zoos use enrichment to, uh, to enhance the well-being of the animals that they take care of. And so whether it's objects or substrate that we provide, if we watch play behavior in their natural habitat, it gives us really great insights into what are the motor patterns, what are the things that keep them engaged in their natural habitat. Right, and I'll take this opportunity to remind everybody, you can send us questions. We're gonna uh, keep going through these uh, short videos on behavior. You can send us some questions about bear behavior or about bear behavior uh, in a changing world at questions at pbears.org or in our chat window or at hashtag Tundra Connections. Um, so BJ, do we have another video to show everybody? Oh, pounce behavior. That's a classic, yeah. that's. I mean, it's, it's interesting, you see that sort of uh, pouncing behavior in a lot of different carnivores. You can see it in coyotes and fox when they're hunting. My guess is what's happened here is this guy's probably spotted something like a, a lemming going across and ducked into the snow. And, and polar bears are opportunistic. They'll put just about anything into their mouth uh, that they think they can get some energy from. Uh, and I'm, he would be plenty happy to eat a lemming. It's not going to make a difference to their year or, or how they're making a living. But that pouncing behavior is very typical of, of carnivores in general. So how do you think in a situation like that, how do you think the energy he gets from the lemming compares to the energy he puts out to get that lemming? Well, that bear is in not bad shape. You can see it's got a nice round butt there, which means it's still got a, a good uh, fat <laughs> store with them. So it, it, they're... You, you see changes in their behavior depending on their body condition. So a bear that's in good shape, um, they're the bears that are willing to spar. We're going to look at some sparring behavior. That's like play fighting. Uh, but what you see, if you see skinny bears uh, out on the coast, the big males that are skinny, they're not really interested in play fighting at mm -hmm. all. They don't need to go there. They're just basically trying to survive to get back out on the ice when they can start doing some hunting again. And Andy, this... this kind of pounce on a lemming behavior looks very canid like to me, but really the polar bear pouncing behavior on top of a seal den is kind of different than that, right? Can you describe that behavior? Yeah, well basically they rear up on their hind legs and, and you sometimes see foxes doing this when they're trying to catch like a, a, a mouse under the snow, like they, they'll actually jump in the air and, and come down. Polar bears rear up on their hind legs and then basically focus their paws on one spot because the snow can be quite thick and, and depending on, on how thick that snow is, it really affects their hunting efficiency. Um, really thick snow is good for the seals, but tough on the bears. And what they want to do is you have to think that there's a snow cave underneath there. And of course the seal has a hole that goes through the ice and into the water. And they don't necessarily have to get the seal, but they do have to close that hole off. And if they close that hole, then they can dig around and find out where the seal pup is. Or if they're really lucky and strike a bonanza, the mother might have actually been in there at the same time. And so you sort of get a two for one deal, the big meal and the small meal. <laughs> um, and so, but that's their whole strategy. So when you're walking, watching polar bears hunt, they're using, they're, they're using their sense of smell because of course, when, especially when it's seal pup time, they can't see where the seals are. So what they're doing is there's rough ridges and that's where these seal pups are, where this ice is rafted up. And what they do is they walk on the downwind side and then as soon as they smell 
um, uh, where a seal is, they basically go into a stalking mode, and they, they it, it, snow is really noisy to walk on, and everybody knows that it crunches and stuff. So the bears just move like a cat, and they move step by step, and they're trying to smell and probably hear where, if they can hear movement under the snow, where they should be pouncing, and then uh, it, it's just like it's it's instantaneous. They just rear up and then they crash down and if they don't break through the first time then they start pounding and pounding and pounding trying to cave in that birth layer um, and then hopefully they're in time and they mm -hmm. they pull out that nice big seal yeah that multiple pounding is a behavior that we try to elicit in zoos and aquariums with big uh, plastic tubs and things like that that are often filled with say frozen fish or something like right that. and then, yeah that's something you'll see bears doing for 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 quite a long time it seems to be give them a, a lot of satisfaction and and really uh, is a great way to, to represent natural behavior in a zoo. Yes. BJ, have we got another uh, video? Uh, the famous play behavior. This is, mm -hmm. this is the one that a lot of tourists come up here to see. Um, it, it's really quite spectacular. Um, the amazing thing about this is these are two young males. Uh, you tend to see it in sort of more like the teenage males, the younger bears. Uh, you don't see it as often in the really dominant individuals. You notice that both these bears are about the same size. Uh, you're very careful in who you wrestle with. Um, and you don't want to be basically dominated by somebody that's too big. So there's a lot of behavior, very ritualized behavior, sort of checking out um, your potential fighting partner. You sort of walk around and they, you see them, they circle each other. And then once they get close, they sort of sniff each other over quite carefully. And then... If you're lucky, you get to see this sort of behavior. Um, it's play behavior because if this was real fighting over something like a female, um, there would be fur everywhere, there would be blood everywhere. Uh, when they're fighting for real in the springtime, when, typically for mates, that's about the only thing they'll fight for seriously like this. Um, you can have, I've seen bears with broken limbs, uh, broken teeth. Uh, I've seen bears that have been blinded in an eye from these sorts of things. And when we catch these bears uh, in the springtime around the mating period, you can tell pretty much who's been mating because they usually have lots of fresh cuts and scars on them. And so it's, uh, it's, it's again, it's a dangerous activity. And that's why this play fighting is important because you're trying to put yourself into this relative uh, skill pool. Am I really big bear or am I still kind of a little bear? Am I really tough? Do I have the right moves to, to be able to drive off another bear when it's really time to fight for a uh, female? And when we look at uh, the information we have on bears, is they don't have a lot of chances to pass their genes on to the next generation. Uh, a lot of these males will not uh, produce very many cubs at all. Um, uh, a male that actually does sire a lot of offspring may get five or six cubs um, into the population, but there's a lot of unsuccessful males as well. Uh, we do have a question, and the question is, how can kids get into animal behavior research? Well, the first thing that kids need to do to get into animal behavior research is really study on their schoolwork and make sure that they're really working hard to, to get to their, to their goals. There's, you can get into science from any number of directions and, you know, really, you know, marrying the love of, of what you're doing with hard work is, is the best advice I can give. If you have any uh, zoo or aquarium in your area and uh, trying to find out what their volunteer or internship programs are, that's a great way to, to get your feet on the ground. And as a behavioral ecologist, I'll have to say one of the most important things you can bring to behavioral ecology or animal behavior is patience. Especially if you like to study bears, because bears do tend to sleep a lot. But patience and a willingness to study non-invasively through observation. I'd, I'd say the other thing is you don't really have to wait till you're a trained uh, biologist or uh, ethologist. You can start right now. There's mm -hmm. lots of organisms that you can study. I mean, there's a lot of behavioral ecologists that just study guppies in a fish tank. I mean, it's actually one of the species that animal behaviorists mm -hmm. study a lot. Now that's a long ways from studying polar bears um, in the wild, but at the same time, you can start to develop your skills of observation. Mm -hmm. um, get yourself a bird book, ask for some binoculars for Christmas and start doing some birding. Get to identify birds. If you, you can't do animal behavior if you don't know what you're looking at. And then of course, once you start 
getting into the identification, well, then you can start to follow the behavior of different species. And um, it, it's an amazing way to spend time and, and just get outside, get into the environment and start to learn, you know, look for those signs that animals have been in an area. So you can start to pick up the skills. One of the skills we use all the time when we're out uh, um, tracking polar bears is we, we actually track them, we follow their tracks. But depending on where you live, uh, it doesn't matter if you live in the desert, there's tracks in the sand, there could be tracks in the mud, there could be tracks in the snow, and you can start to build your own skill set. And uh, when I was a kid, I grew up in a big city in Vancouver on the west coast of Canada, but there were empty lots, and I went in there all the time, and there were little snakes, and we would catch them, I'd bring them home, my mom says, put it back, and I'd put it back, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, but it was always that sort of thing, you know, we'd have bees, and we'd put them in a jar and look at them, and then, well, get stung a little bit, but you let them go, <laughs> and, you know, you, you, you have to get out, and you have to experience, and start building your skill set, but eventually, you're going to have to go to university, so you think it's tough going, you know, from kindergarten to grade 12, well, um, there might be just as many years of university to get to the sort of the advanced levels of training that allows you to do sort of the more rigorous research. Um, but the love of animal behavior uh, is something that people flock to around the world. Mm -hmm. A lot of these people that are here on the tundra buggies right now, they're here because they love watching animals. Um, and even if it's not their profession, it is a passion for them. And, and animal behavior also is really gaining prominence in terms of its importance to wildlife conservation and wildlife management. If you think about how an animal engages in their environment, as that environment changes, sometimes their behavior gives us the best indication of how flexible they'll be in the face of environmental change. And so really being able to, to develop your skills in that, in that regard might be the best way to get into conservation as well. Great, thanks. Uh, BJ, do we have another video to look at? This is a bear on thin ice. <laughs> you can tell it's moving very, very cautiously. And it's interesting, it's uh, one of the times when you'll see what I call the starfish behavior from a bear. They get into a situation where the ice is really thin and you can see she's this bear's spreading out, trying to get its weight spread out as best. Oh, yeah. breakthrough, it's not a lot of fun. So bears don't want to get wet. They really don't want to um, uh, fall through in the ice. It's incredibly tiring for, for a bear to move through ice like this. So um, they want to stay on top as much as they possibly can. Hmm. And we just saw this right outside our window this morning. Uh, we had some very slushy snow and ice on top of a shallow lake and a bear was really, really struggling to get through it. Yeah, that was a big male, and he did not look very happy no. about having made that path decision, so he really wanted to get the heck out of there. I think it also kind of exemplifies uh, how we think of uh, polar bears as marine mammals, of course, because they depend on the, the marine ecosystem for, for their survival, but they really prefer to walk on top of the ocean as opposed to swim through it. We hear a lot about how polar bears are great swimmers, but as the ice uh, retreats, They'd rather, they'd rather be on something solid. Yeah, I, I've seen uh, in the springtime when mothers come out of their dens with little cubs here, they'll walk for miles and miles and miles to avoid going through open water. Uh, she won't take her small cubs through. They'll take larger cubs through uh, water once they're about a year old or around that age, but they really don't like getting wet. It's not what polar bears want to do. They will get wet and they'll go in the water particularly to hunt. Uh, but it's not a preferred activity for them. Uh, they lose a lot of energy. It's not quite as efficient as walking on the surface. So it's, uh, it's interesting. You see that they'll, they'll walk even on, when they're out on the sea ice for miles to avoid going through uh, open water. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a question that, that relates to that, and that is, uh, why is the polar bear classified as a marine mammal? Well, it's, it's partly because it's totally reliant on, on the sea ice uh, as its primary habitat. That's where its uh, nutrition comes from. Uh, if you give a polar bear a choice, it will spend 100% of its life out on the sea ice. And in many areas, we have polar bears that, uh, particularly off the Alaska coast, that are born on the sea ice, are raised on the sea ice, and they actually never leave the sea ice. They'll die out there. They only come ashore uh, in most areas if the sea ice melts, so that's why we have polar bears on shore around us here. 
Um, and the other reason that they'll come ashore in most areas in their range is because they want to, uh, uh, pregnant females need a place to give birth to their cubs and they want a stable environment to do that. And sea ice can be quite dynamic and drifting and moving. <laughs> Uh, it can break up and they don't, it's a riskier option to den out on the sea ice. So they really just come ashore to, to reproduce or wait for the sea ice to come back. And of course they can't hunt their seals from inside the water also. They need to be above it. That's right. So, so a polar bear catches um, seals when they're um, basically from an ice surface. So they, they can't swim after seal. Seals are a lot faster and so uh, they basically either use the water as a means to get close to seals and then try to jump out of the water onto a seal that's hauled out on ice or they hunt from the surface of the ice and try to get seals as they come up for a breath or as we discussed for inside their birth layer. Mm -hmm. And do they migrate on the ice? Polar bears migrate, yeah. We're, what we're seeing right now are, are bears migrating to the north coast here just around Churchill and they're migrating northward because this is where the sea ice will form first and what they want to do is basically get out on that sea ice as soon as they can and then as the sea ice uh, forms further and further into the bay they'll stay right with that advancing edge and right along that edge where the ice is forming um, there's a lot of they'll bump into seals that haven't seen a polar bear for several months and they're a little bit naive and they're quite vulnerable to predation. So the bears are right on that edge, uh, moving, moving farther and farther away from here as soon as they possibly can. Um, but there is a migration pattern because once they go, they'll go several hundred miles away or hundreds of kilometers away, and they'll actually come right back here. So they have this amazing ability to navigate. How they do it, we're not sure uh, because there's no marks out there to use for navigation. There's nothing like, oh, there's a big cliff over there. Uh, they head straight out into Hudson Bay. Uh, it's about 500 miles across, 800 kilometers across, and they'll go almost over to the other side, but they'll come right back here next year. Um, so uh, incredible ability to navigate, but we don't know. It's, maybe it's the sun, maybe it's the stars, um, but there's no signpost telling you where Churchill is. <laughs> so you've been studying polar bears for over 30 years. Uh, can you tell our viewers how you studied that kind of migration pattern early in your career and how the study of migration behavior has changed until now and what new technologies we're using to well, study that? Well, yeah, the, the, big, the big advancement has been uh, the development of radio collars. And so when I first uh, put radio collars on polar bears, um, they, were, they were called VHF radios, very high frequency, and they put out these little beeps, you know, bing, bing, and so we'd fly around in a plane with antennas on it, and then we'd go way out on the ice and try to listen, so you got to fly around, and then once you find it, you have antennas on both sides, and you basically steer your, your uh, aircraft in, and then you find the one location, then you go look for another one. It's incredibly inefficient. Uh, we'd spend hours and hours flying around. <laughs> Uh, now we use uh, collars that have a GPS built right into them. So the same thing that you have in your iPhone or your car, you have that GPS that tells you where you are. Well, the polar bear collars have a GPS built into it. It gets a location and then it sends that location up to a satellite and that satellite then sends the data back down to us and it comes in an email and then we can map out where these bears are. And uh, you can see some of these bears on, on some of the polar bear tracking uh, sites uh, through PBI as well. So it's, uh, it's, quite, it's quite fun to watch. You can see where the bears go. Um, and it's amazing technology. We use that to try to understand uh, migration patterns, but we also look at uh, things like habitat. So what type of sea ice do they prefer? And then we also use it to try to understand when the bears um, are moving from land onto the sea ice. So when is freeze up from a polar bear perspective? Uh, and then as well, when is it breaking up and when do they come ashore? So those are important monitoring uh, parameters for us. We wanna know how long are the bears on land? And, and we know that that period of time is increasing. And our concern is that there's probably some threshold at which they just can't uh, deal with an, uh, an ever increasing on land period. Mm -hmm. They just can't bring enough energy on shore with them. But uh, so those are the sorts of things that we study with radio callers. We do have a question from one of our viewers that I think relates to uh, polar bears as a marine mammal and 
also uh, maybe migratory behavior, and that is, are there any major laws uh, in place to protect polar bears now, and are there laws that still need to be passed in order to protect them in the future? Yeah, we have a lot of really good laws, um, and polar bears um, are, for the most part, very well managed. One of the interesting things is, uh, is you know, sometimes you'll hear that there's more polar bears now than there were 50 years ago, and that's actually correct. The reason we had so few bears 50 years ago is because we had no regulation on harvest. We had an incredible number of bears uh, being killed uh, every year, and what was happening is the bears were going extinct. Uh, in some of their parts of their range. So actually in 1956, the Russians shut down all harvest of polar bears in their territory. But that still didn't deal with the other uh, range states, which are Canada, Greenland, uh, Norway, uh, and uh, of course Alaska. And so they didn't have any rules in place. So in 1973, we put in place an international agreement that really uh, increased the control on polar bear harvesting and management. And that was an imp uh, important component. So in the United States, there's the Marine Mammal Protection Act, that that's a really important uh, piece of the puzzle. And what's really interesting is right this week, um, there's an ongoing um, uh, petition to have polar bears listed under the Convention uh, for Migratory Species. So that would mm. give other protection for the species and increase the sort of the international cooperation to protect the species. So that we should have a decision in the next day or so about whether or not polar bears will will be uh, included. That I I, I believe it's strongly um, uh, uh, important that we use as many mechanisms as we can to ensure the long term conservation of the species. Yeah, that was a very timely question. Yeah. Um, so I'm just noting there's a polar bear right outside of our window just yeah. kind of walking along and uh, BJ apparently it's out of camera range, right? We do have one more video though, I believe, um, mm -hmm. that we can talk about. Oh sure, so Andy was talking earlier about how polar bears use their sense of smell for hunting, but polar bears and as other large or solitary carnivores, solitary animals, will use their sense of smell to navigate their social landscape as well. This bear was walking along with its nose to the ground and came across a, a, a track of another polar bear and it stopped this bear in its tracks. So we feel uh, we've done some uh, experiments that have shown us that polar bears can distinguish uh, scent associated with paw prints of uh, whether it's a male or a female, if it's a female and a male smelling that scent, whether it's a potential breeding partner. And this is incredibly important. So if, if you think about it, uh, you know, polar bear may range up to 600,000 square kilometers. That's an enormous range. But when it becomes time to breed, they have to be able to find another polar bear. And so scent communication in polar bears, as in other uh, animals that, that are solitary, is an extremely important part of of how they find each other when they need to. But thinking about polar bears now, uh, the scent that they leave behind is directly associated with the, their sea ice habitat. And when the sea ice is intact, there's an, there can leave a nice trail behind. So the trail consists of probably very low amplitude scent signals. And so that the continuousness of that trail is very important uh, to be efficient. As the sea ice breaks up and the, the extent of the fracturing uh, increases, we're going to find that those trails are, are no longer continuous and it's going to be harder for polar bears to find mates when it's time to breed. And that can have a profound implication on the health of the population. The whole issue of olfaction and, and your sense of smell from a bear's perspective is, is absolutely incredibly important when you consider how they make a living. Now, as primates, or um, monkeys basically, we are very vision focused. So we think about seeing other members of our species and that's how we interact. Uh, but when you think about it from a bear's perspective, um, because there's so much scent in their whole environment right. that they are getting living in a very, very different world. And if you want an example, um, watch your dog mm -hmm. next time you're out for a walk and your dog is living in a world that we have no exposure to. Um, everything is interesting for, from, for them because of that sense of smell. Well, that's how a polar bear makes its living. It finds its food um, and it finds its mate using its sense of smell. But back to the dog, it's actually quite interesting because you'll notice that dogs will often pee on a fire hydrant, a tree, a signpost. 
other bears and, and lots of other mammals will also look for those same kinds of structures in their natural environment to leave a scent signal on. If you look around you, polar bears don't really have those kinds of signposts to use. And so over evolutionary time, they've, they've developed a different adaptation that is specifically tailored to their environment. That's fascinating to watch. The, the weirdest one of those scent marks has to be the giant panda. The giant panda. Doing a headstand. The headstand to mark a tree. So they, yeah. they basically stand up on their front paws and rub their, um, yeah. their rump up against the tree to leave a scent mark. It's, yeah. it's quite something. And the females will come by and we find that females will choose the scent mark that is the highest on the tree. And so giant panda males have developed all sorts of behaviors to try to get that scent higher so that they can make a female think that it's a really big male. It's like the big dog wants to pee as high as they can. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and our other North American bears, brown bears and black bears, stand up against trees on their hind legs and just scratch the trees and get their scent onto the trees that way. The, right? There's some great videos. Go on YouTube and look for the U.S. Geological Survey yes. and they have some wonderful videos of of polar bears rubbing against a tree. It, it looks like uh, it looks like they're enjoying it, you know, but it's, it's also that they're trying to communicate their presence in an area. Uh, sometimes the grizzly bears will also lay down these mark trails mm -hmm. and right. I think that's probably the the root of where you know right. Bigfoot or Sasquatch came from because people would see these big footprints but actually it's just a bear walking along and they rub their feet as they walk and then they also urinate along the pathway um, and every bear that comes through the area does this then quite often rubs against a tree it's a uh, there's a lot of neat things that bears do. And I understand some of these grizzly bear trails are literally hundreds, maybe thousands of years old. Mm. Yeah, I've seen some that, that have obviously been there for a long time because the tree, you can just see in the tree that they've been scratched up for for a long time. How old, it's hard to say, but it's, uh, it's clear that some of these have a traditional use that goes back many generations mm -hmm. of bears. Huh. That's fascinating. Uh, we do have a question from Mrs. Fowler's class in South Dakota. How does the changing habitat change the behavior of polar bears when they're denning or migrating or other behaviors? Well, from, from that perspective, one of the big things that we've got is, is changing sea ice condition uh, affects quite a lot just how um, polar bears find their food. So one of the things that happens, we think, is, is there's more... Um, movement in the sea ice, it changes the dynamics of how you find your food. So one of the things is seals aren't stupid, they don't want to be eaten, and one of the things they do is if there's lots of broken ice, they'll come up in the middle of a hole uh, where there's, there's no ice around because they know there's no bear there. So if there's lots of open water, the seals start to come up in um, in this open area and the polar bear hunting efficiency, efficiency drops dramatically. So the major thing that happens, and as we discussed with finding mates, is you break up the habitat, it's much more energetically expensive. Mm -hmm. Sea ice is drifting all the time on wind and currents. In Hudson Bay, we have a big counterclockwise gyre that moves the sea ice around. Um, and as the ice is thinner and more mobile, it, it basically changes the dynamics of, of the um, uh, ice. And so you can think of sea ice almost as a treadmill. Um, you know, if you're on a treadmill in a gym, you turn up the speed of the treadmill, you're going to burn more energy. That's one of the concerns we have about changing sea ice conditions in the Arctic is that we're speeding up the treadmill on the bears. It makes it harder for them to get back where they want to be. Um, it also means they're going to burn up more energy. Mm -hmm. And if it also means they can't kill seals as effectively, we run into real serious problems uh, in terms of the energy balance. Mm -hmm. hmm. Um, so we're getting some questions about where we can see bears and actions we can take for saving bears and their habitats. Do you guys want to take a stab at that and we'll move toward closing this? Well, Churchill is one of the best places you could hope to see uh, polar bears. I've come, been coming up here for the past 20 years, uh, every few years, and it, it never, never gets boring. It's really amazing to be out here in, the, in their habitat. So we're the ones that are in the zoo right now, and they're the ones that are around us watching. And it's fascinating to have an opportunity to see them display a range of behaviors in their habitat. We've got a bear on screen right now. He's just waking up from a bit of a nap, and he's rolling around there, uh, seemingly having a good stretch and a good roll. And uh, it looks like he's enjoying himself. It's great to come up here and see them. It's probably by far the best place to see polar bears is up in this part of the world. 
Um, you can head to Svalbard in Norway, uh, but that's pretty. It's relatively expensive, usually from ships up there. Uh, there are some places in Alaska around the town of Kaktovik you can see polar bears, uh, but it's not easy to see them. There's no question. It's not inexpensive. First polar bear I ever saw was in a zoo, uh, and and now we've got really world class zoos uh, where you can go and see polar bears up close and personal. Um, and, and it's a good way to start to get a, a little bit of an insight of how uh, basically they make a living. I mean, a lot of the behaviors you'll watch in the, in the new sort of modern zoos are, are natural behaviors that they would use in the wild as well. Absolutely, and that connection with an animal that's in front of you is, is priceless. And also, there's typically many opportunities at a zoo to learn about polar bears, to learn about their environment, to learn about what they need, and also to learn more about what you can do to help save polar bears. I would also add that these types of connections, like our camera with explore.org, are amazing ways to see polar bears in the wild without um, increasing your carbon footprint in the process. So I, I am a huge advocate for this type of outreach. And I'll speak for the other species of bears, I guess. Uh, certainly you can see them in zoos around the country, AZA accredited zoos and aquariums. And I think we have every species of bear, including, you know, sun bear and pandas and Indian bears. But in North America, you can also go to uh, state and national parks. All I will advocate, in, in addition to what Megan and Andy said, is that please stay safe in bear country. Um, it's easy to not be safe in bear country. So, you know, uh, be bear aware. Don't feed bears because a fed bear is a dead bear, and we don't want that. And so, um, you know, you use bear-proof trash cans, you, you keep your food safe, and you keep yourself safe in bear country. So, um, well, let's uh, wrap up. Thank you for joining us today. Polar Bears International's goal is to keep polar bears in the Arctic always, and it's important to remember that time remains to save polar bears in their sea ice habitat. We can all do our part to make this happen. So thank you at home for uh, turning your lights down when you're not in the room, turning your computer and TV off at the power bar for taking shorter showers for, you know, using uh, local farms and um, voting with your family's dollars at, at the grocery store. Are there personal actions that you guys take to help conserve the environment and save our sea ice? Well, turn down the thermostat, that's a big one. I, I think that's really important. That's one of our biggest uh, resource uses uh, in your family home. Um, and when perhaps uh, you're looking to buy a home, you should be looking at energy efficiency in your house. So think about how big a home you really need. Mm -hmm. our, our families have gotten smaller and our houses have gotten bigger. It makes no sense. Um, again, when you're looking at vehicles, people still are gonna be driving cars for a long time to come but look at the most energy efficient vehicle. And uh, I think those are important things. I also think it's really important to just get outside, to, to close out your electronic devices and find activities that you like to do outside. Go for walks, ride your bike. If you're a parent, try to support your children's access to the outdoors and lead by example. That's one of the things I always try to remind myself. So thanks for joining us. Please visit the Tundra Connections page on our website and take the post broadcast survey and you'll be entered into a drawing to win a free polar bear adoption. Um, our heartfelt thanks to Julene Reed, an Apple Distinguished Educator and PBI Education Advisory Council member who directs the PBI Tundra Connections program and to our platinum sponsor, Frontiers North Tundra Buggy Adventure. Remember, we're here on Tundra Buggy, Buggy number one. In Canada Goose, which sponsors our parkas and a lot of other things. Support has also been provided by Pearls of the Planet, a project of explore.org, a direct charitable activity of the Annenberg Foundation. We're also grateful to Telestream, makers of Wirecast, Parks Canada, Discovery Education, the Center for Global Education, and Taking IT Global. Thank you for joining us today, and go save bears, save our sea ice, and conserve everything that you can on our planet for the sake of bears and other creatures so that they'll have natural behaviors forever. Thanks everybody, bye bye.